I want to introduce our last panelist of the day. Make sure you stay tuned to the end of the event, though, because we have some special things going on. Our next panelist is Katherine Kellogg. She is going to be talking to us about zero waste living. She is the founder of Going Zero Waste. She's the spokesperson for Plastic Free Living for National Geographic. She's the chief sustainability officer at the One Movement. She's the author of 101 Ways to Go Zero Waste, and she is located in California. Welcome, Catherine. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So I'm going to let you take it away because I know you have some really exciting things to share with us. Of course. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, hello everyone. I'm really excited to be chatting with you today about zero waste living, which isn't as scary as it sounds. So the way I really like to start my presentation is talking a bit about the definition of zero waste living. So when it comes to living more sustainably or a more eco-friendly life, there are so many different ways that we can choose to approach this. And for me personally, I really started with zero waste living. And I think that's because trash is something that is so incredibly tangible. You can't really see a greenhouse gas emission. You can't really touch it, feel it, um, but you can see, touch and feel trash. So I think it's a really fantastic entry point for so many people because it's something that we have a lot of control over in our daily lives. So what's the definition of zero waste living? Well, the technical definition nothing to a landfill. But the more complex definition that I personally really like is to completely write waste out of existence. Because if we're only looking at what we put in our trash can, that's a really narrow view, right? There are so many other things that can go to waste. And that applies to both me as well as the planet, right? So we can have a way, we can have a waste of resources. And if we're only looking at what we throw away, I just think that's a really missed opportunity. There's so much to the story. The true goal of living a zero waste or low waste lifestyle is to move from a linear economy to a circular one. So this is how we currently live. We live in a linear economy where we take resources from the earth, we turn them into products, and then at the end of their useful life, we throw them into a giant hole in the ground. Doesn't really make much sense, right? So with a circular economy, instead, what we would do is we would take resources from the earth, turn them into products, and then find a way to reuse those resources over and over again. So let's talk about a few of the problems with a linear economy. Well, the first problem is that it assumes there's an infinite supply of resources, and we all know there's not. We're running out of many of these resources. And I always like to ask people at this point in time if you've ever heard of Earth Overshoot Day. So it's a day on the calendar to mark when we've sustainably consumed all of the resources the Earth can produce for a calendar year. And we recently just hit it. I don't remember the exact date for 2021, but I do know in 2019, it was July 31st. In 2020, it was August 6th. We bought ourselves a week. If you think about all the lockdowns, all the measures that we took at the beginning of COVID, where a lot of people weren't traveling, many people were off the road, we bought ourselves six days. That's it. And I believe we were back in July in 2021. Um, like I said, I don't remember the exact date, but we're consuming a lot of resources and we're using a lot of water, uh, trees, coal, fossil fuels. We are using so many resources and we're not finding good ways of keeping them in play. So what this would look like in actual practice if we were to create a circular world, a world where we could continue to use our resources over and over again, when you would go to the store to buy a couch, then if the couch cushions got too flat and depressed, then you would be able to buy more cotton batting to stuff them. You could buy new covers for them if the covers started to wear. Everything would be modular. If 
they were so beyond repair, you could send them back, they would compost it, use that to grow more cotton. The base would be steel or wood, and it's something that could be composted or the steel could be melted down and reused over to build a new frame. Everything would be designed with intention and with purpose. So we have to ask ourselves why. Why are we continuing to use resources and not finding ways to sustainably reclaim them and reuse them over and over again? And one of the main reasons is acceleration for more profit. Maybe you've heard of planned obsolescence. Maybe you've had a phone that after two years, uh, you downloaded its new settings update and you notice that all of a sudden it's running a lot slower to intentionally try and force you into buying a new model, right? I'm sure many of us have experienced many of these things where it's more expensive to repair something than it is to buy something new. And that's because we're constantly driven and forced to buy new products instead of reusing and taking care of what we already have. And what this really does is it devalues our resources, right? What's the true cost of a resource? You know, if you buy a swath of land that has a whole bunch of trees planted on it and you cut them, clear cut them all to make paper, then the next time it rains, all of a sudden you have to deal with mudslides, right? What was the true cost of that land? What was the true value the trees were providing in order to keep that soil anchored whenever it rains? We're not really pricing things appropriately because we don't value a lot of our natural resources in the way that we should. We've lost so much connection with the earth. We've lost a lot of connection with the way things work. Uh, we've lost just so much connection with our waste as well because someone comes, picks it up and takes it away and we never have to see it again. We never really have to confront our overconsumption. We don't have to deal with all the trash and the recycling that piles up in our homes because someone comes and takes care of it for us. So what this is really about is it's really about diving a little bit deeper into these systems. Who makes our products? Where are they going when we're finished with them? And how can we adjust our relationship to these things? And how can we adjust that relationship in reflection with the natural world? I think it's really interesting because humans are the only creature on earth that create trash. If you think about it, everyone else lives in perfect harmony with nature. They've created these perfect symbiotic relationships but we create a lot of trash, right? We don't see any squirrels going out to the supermarkets and buying tiny plastic wrap pasta or acorns, which would be, albeit adorable. Um, so what we're trying to do is really mimic these relationships. When a tree drops an acorn, that's not trash. Instead, it's gonna be composted and turned into a nutrient rich soil that's going to provide nourishment for the tree. It's going to feed a squirrel. It's going to sprout a new tree. Everything has intention and purpose. And my dream and hope for the future and what many of us think through the zero waste movement, the goals with that is for our products to be designed with intention and purpose and to have a positive net benefit. So the term zero waste, let's talk about it. A lot of people don't like it. I mean, I'm not overly particularly crazy about it myself because the word zero really turns a lot of people off, right? Zero, that's a very finite word, absolutely zero. Uh, but the term was first used in an industrial setting. A guy named Paul Palmer right here in the Bay Area, Oakland, California, uh, invented a company, created a company, founded a company, that's the more appropriate word, uh, called Zero Waste Services. And the goal was to take chemicals that companies didn't need and to give them to companies who needed them, therefore avoiding those chemicals from going to waste. And today you can still get your business zero waste certified cradle to cradle certified and closed loop certified. And all of these things mean the exact same thing. Most of these certifications require an 80 to 90% diversion rate from landfill, which is a lot more possible and way more palatable than zero, or at least I think so. And I also just wanna say, we are going to be having a Q&A at the end of this. So feel free to pop any questions in the chat um, as I'm going throughout my presentation. And as I've been talking a lot about this closed loop system or being able to reclaim and reuse our materials and resources, you might be thinking that sounds an awful lot like recycling. And you'd be correct. That is absolutely the whole goal of recycling. But our current recycling system is a little bit flawed because it requires a business to buy those recycled materials to use them in their products. 
recycling is a business. And a lot of us view it as charity or charitable because so many of us have been taught from such a young age that recycling is the best thing you can do for the planet. And while it certainly is fantastic, we also need companies buying these materials and actually putting them in their products. But one of the major issues is that a lot of our recycling is really contaminated. We also tend to skip straight to recycle, but that very famous saying, uh, there are two other words that come before it, which are equally, if not more important, which is to first reduce what you need, uh, reuse what you have, and then recycle. So it's really curious why we're all so excited about recycling and not the first two. And that's because recycling is highly, highly marketable. So if I wanted to sell you something, do you think I would sell you on the idea of reducing or not buying my product? Probably not. There's really only one ad I know of that has ever done this, which is Patagonia's ad, do not buy this jacket. I'm sure there might be a handful more, but very, very few. Then we have reusing. And reusing definitely does have a bit more marketing appeal to it. Um, there are a lot of heritage brands and brands that use this marketing to have, you know, they have lifetime warranties, right? Something like Le Creuset. Um, there's a lifetime warranty on their pans. And there are, are several brands that are very committed to you reusing and having their products over a very long period of time. But for most brands, recycling is the way to go because it can still encourage you to consume more and more and consume more that you probably might not even need. They did a really interesting study at the University of Texas where they threw a party. And at the drink table, they had a trash can next to it. And they found that if there was a trash can next to the drink table, people would reuse their cup over and over again. But if there was a recycling bin next to the party table or the drink table, then they would get a new cup every single time. Because the feelings of recycling, it makes you feel like you're doing so good you do it more than you should, which winds up having a negative impact because of all the resources that go into the creation of products. And our recycling system currently isn't very efficient. In 2018, China, the largest global buyer of recycled paper and plastic products stopped accepting all shipments with the contamination rate over 1%. And to put that into perspective, some of the best recycling facilities in the United States operate at a 4% contamination rate with some of the other ones that aren't doing so great at a 30 to 40% contamination rate. So a lot of our stuff isn't even being recycled. I'm gonna run down really quickly a few recycling tips for each of these materials and specifically be talking about plastic a little bit more in the next slide. So aluminum and steel is pretty great when it comes to recycling. 75% um, of all the aluminum currently in the market has been recycled and a steel tin, like a tin of beans, can go from your curbside bin back on the shelf in 90 days. It's a very closed loop streamlined process. Uh, paper is pretty great as well if it's being composted and reused. However, recycled content being used in paper is not as high as I personally would like to see it. Um, we need to make sure that paper is clean though. It needs to be clean and it needs to be dry. As far as aluminum and steel, uh, make sure you tap out any excess liquid. And if you have aluminum foil, it needs to be cleaned and roll it into a ball um, that's bigger than your fist. And then you can throw it in your bin. If you put it flat, um, it often gets missorted with paper, uh, which is causing contamination. So contamination is when you put the wrong thing in your bin, for instance, Christmas lights or dirty diapers or bowling balls, uh, right? We don't want any of that in there. Um, or if you put the right material in, like aluminum foil, but you put it in covered and caked uh, with food, right? So those would be two examples of contamination. Glass is a little trickier. While it is 100% recyclable, we don't currently have a lot of recycling facilities that are actually handling glass. And because it is so heavy and we have so few places doing it, most of our glass is sent to the landfill because recycling companies simply aren't, it's, it's, it's not worth it to truck the glass all the way to the handlers, have them reuse it because businesses just aren't, aren't buying it and aren't using it. There's just not a good market for it. And then we get to plastic. 
plastic is really interesting uh, because it's not really recyclable. Now, with the exceptions of plastic one and two, um, the other numbers, there's not really any good markets for them. And as of today, only 9% of all plastic ever produced has ever been recycled. And the recycle sign doesn't really mean anything. What you need to be paying attention to is the number inside of the recycle sign. So plastics one through seven. So one and two have a really good system here in the US, um, but three through seven, it's very, very questionable. But what I find to be most interesting about it is a lot of plastics are toxic. So I'm sure many of you have heard of BPA and seen a lot of BPA-free signs. But what they don't tell you is a lot of BPA has been replaced with BPS. And BPS is even more endocrine disrupting than BPA itself. So a lot of these plastic are synthetic estrogens and they interfere with our hormones. And that's actually how I got started in sustainable living. I had a really bad hormonal imbalance and started really paying close attention to the beauty products I was using, the cleaning products I was using and reducing my usage of single use plastics. So one of my biggest tips for you when it comes to single use plastics is really trying to avoid fat um, that's bought in plastic. So for instance, oils, like olive oil, vegetable oil, peanut butters, anything with a really high fat content because estrogen hangs into fat and that what is in the plastic is leaching into your food, uh, as well as avoiding food storage um, in plastic when you're in control of it in your own home. Those are kind of my, my big takeaway points when it comes to avoiding that. But plastics currently in 84% of drinking water worldwide. These are microplastics, and a lot of them come from things like tires, glitter, and your leggings. So polyester, very common fabric used specifically in activewear, fleece, all of that sheds microplastic pieces every single time you wash them and they do wind up in our waterways. So what are some of the overarching themes? How can we work on many of these issues that I just discussed? So I think one of the most radical things you can do today is to simply find contentment and focus on the belongings you have, valuing experiences over things. Marketers are very good at telling us what we need to make us feel like we're enough. They prey on a lot of our insecurities. But if you're content, but if you're content with what you have and yourself, then it's gonna be a lot easier for you to avoid the messaging that makes you feel like you're not good enough. And I think COVID in 2020 really put a lot of things into perspective. Uh, I know it certainly did for me, which is, you know, at the end of our lives, what are you going to remember? Are you going to remember the things you bought or are you going to remember the people that you love? And I know for me, the thing I was most excited about was being able to go home and hug my mom and have dinner at my kitchen table and sharing those memories with people rather than focusing on buying more and more. So a few ways that I like to avoid impulse purchases is to wait 30 days before making a purchase. Next time you want something, uh, you're out at the store, you see it, say, yeah, okay, um, 30 days, just to make sure it's actually gonna add value to your life. And maybe you only need it for a temporary short period of time. Can you rent it? Can you borrow it from a friend? There's so many other things you can do rather than buying it. And when it does come time to buy something, make sure you're buying something made really well, something that's gonna last. And then I really like to end my talk with a few action items. So here's four of the biggest ways we can have an impact in our daily lives. And that's number one with food. So reducing how many animal products we eat. Um, the average US citizen eats three quarters a pound of meat a day. And that doesn't even include other animal products like dairy or eggs. So simply reducing some animal products because they are the most resource intensive products to make. And then also focusing on distance. So trying to eat with the seasons, eat what's local to you and what's currently growing in your area. It's always fantastic to support a local farm through something like a community supported agriculture or CSA boxes. Housing. So I live in an apartment. <laughs> I can't really put solar panels on my roof, but you can get uh, your energy provided through a local supplier like Arcadia or Clean Choice. These work with community solar projects 
to offset your energy use. So that's a really great alternative if you're also in an apartment, as well as if you own your home, opting for renewable energy. Transportation. So uh, commuting, carpooling, riding your bike, walking. I have a 30 minute rule. If it would take under 30 minutes to walk there, I walk or bike. And that really just helps to ensure a lot of my local transport is done on foot. And then now that many of us are back flying, making sure we're making those trips a lot more meaningful. So instead of a whole bunch of short flights and popping over a lot, try and stay somewhere a little bit longer and have a more meaningful time when you're traveling. And then last is trash and recycling, what we just talked a whole bunch about. So these are gonna be my top eight takeaways for you today, which is number one, to buy less. Implement one of those 30 day buy bans. Make sure you're analyzing your purchases and buying what you actually need and what you actually love. And this will help you so much because when it comes to decluttering, you won't really need to do a lot of it because you've only been buying the things that are truly valuable and that you actually want in your life. Instead of using disposable products, think paper plates, uh, plastic flatware, uh, paper towels, which is number three, switch to using real items. So many resources go into producing our disposable products and by switching to reusable products and using the same ones over and over and over again, you're gonna be saving a lot of resources in the long run. For instance, paper towels, just looking at the water footprint of that. So it takes eight gallons of water to make one paper plate, it takes 37 gallons of water to make a roll of toilet paper. It takes so much water to create a roll of paper towels. And in fact, in the US, we flush 27,000 trees down the toilet every day. So switching to more reusable products like paper, um, reusable cloth towels. I have a bidet attachment on my toilet. Uh, I use reusable period products, right? These are all easy ways to reduce the amount of resources we're consuming. Bring a reusable water bottle with you. I personally love to use a stainless steel one. I'm not super crazy about using a plastic water bottle uh, simply because of all the plastic things we mentioned earlier. Eating more whole foods, just adding more plants to your plate. I never advocate for any specific diet, but I do believe that we can all add a little bit more fruit and veg, seeing that the Standard American diet, which stands for SAD, which I think is very funny, um, mostly involves around meat, wheat, cheese, and potatoes. So adding some more grains, I think that's the one thing all nutritionists can agree upon is that in the US, we do not eat enough fruits and vegetables. So adding more of those to our plate and ensuring that we're storing them properly when we get home to preserve them, because uh, we don't want them to go to waste. And if we do have any food goes bad, we do have any food that goes bad, it's really important that we compost it. So composting is one of the best things that you can do for the environment because on average, 16% of all methane emissions in the U.S. come from landfills, and most of that is from organic matter that can't break down. And if food waste, if it were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases behind the United States and China. So setting up a home compost bin is something that is fantastic, but a lot of cities subsidize compost bins, and there are many companies that will also pick up your compost direct from your door and turn it into a nutrient-rich soil um, that can be returned to the earth and used to grow more and more products. Then we have DIY cleaning. This is one of my favorite swaps and I have a tons of recipes in my book and on my blog if you're looking for more natural cleaning solutions. And then number eight, my favorite way to end this is to make a monthly practice of writing your legislators. This isn't about being perfect. It is instead about using your actions as a signal to show the market that you are demanding change writing your legislators and ensuring that we are making sustainable habits and sustainable policy that is going to be helpful for everyone. So if you want composting, because maybe um, you're not a very good composter and you'd love to see your city pick up composting to make that easy for everyone, get in the habit of writing them. Uh, get in the habit of calling your senators, calling your Congress people and demanding that we have change. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to now head to Q&A. That was amazing. Thank you so much. I do have some exciting questions for you. Um, I wanted to start with, for the people that are just now getting into this, um, what is the best starting point? Like, What would you recommend a person starts with right away? So I think 
one of the things that's really interesting about trash or waste is that it's all individual to every single one of us. Right. And having done many trash audits, I mean, the top three are definitely food waste, food packaging, and paper towels. So those are some pretty easy starting points. But if you want to go beyond that, the best suggestion is to do a trash audit, which is where you take note and stock of what you personally throw away. So maybe you're going, you've got a family and you go through a bunch of almond milk cartons, right? You're like, wow, I actually throw out six almond cartons a week. So what can you do? You can look at buying a larger carton of almond milk instead of a smaller one, or maybe you try making your own, just very simple. It's literally water and blended almonds and you'd be saving a lot of money as well. So you can find the changes that are gonna have the biggest impact for you. So instead of trying to address 100% of everything you're doing, find the most impactful things. So that way you're spending your time on the things that really matter and you're not spending too much time on the things that don't. I love that. And what that kind of leads me into the next thing, like what would be um, your recommendation for the easiest swaps to cut down on waste and plastic use? So paper towels, right? That's one of the easiest swaps. No one believes me. No one believes me, but I promise you, put your paper towels in a very hard to reach place. Put them at the tippy top of your garage where you really got to get on a ladder to go get them and then replace them with a stack of cloth towels. It is so easy. I can't even imagine using paper towels because using cloth ones are so incredibly simple. You just, it's the same, it's the same motion. You just wipe up the spill and you just give it a little rinse, put it over your sink, you know, let it dry. It's so easy. It's such an easy one and it'll have such a big impact. That's huge for me because I definitely need that. I'm just thinking of my own inventory and I'm like, that is number, that's probably my first one that I'm going to start with for sure. And then last but not least, we would really love to know what inspired you to even get into this, to start researching this topic. And then what would be your uh, favorite resource for the information? So what really inspired me was in college, I had a really, really bad hormonal imbalance. And I just really started looking more at the products that were coming into my daily life, specifically looking at the synthetic estrogens and how those were affecting me personally. So a lot of synthetic estrogens come from beauty products, cleaning products, plastic, carpets, mattresses. So a lot of people don't know this. A lot of the memory foam that you're buying in your mattress is plastic and it emits VOCs into your home. Um, it has an off gassing period. So definitely look more into that. And if you are in the market for a new mattress, one, that's one of my biggest suggestions is really try and find um, an organic one or one that's not made from plastic. And some of my favorite resources book-wise, Estro Generation is a fantastic one. It specifically looks at these synthetic estrogens in our environment and how it affects us as humans and how it affects our wildlife and how it's affecting the natural world. I think that's a very fantastic resource. And if you're looking for more sustainable swaps and tips, then I can recommend my blog or my book, um, goingzerowaste.com or 101 Ways to Go Zero Waste. Thank you. I was, that was my next thing. I was going to say, how can we find you? So I appreciate all of the amazing tips that you gave us um, and the information. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me.